All right, if I could uh, call us to, to order. Uh, we're very fortunate this afternoon to have Ambassador Pierre Vermont here with us. Uh, he, as you know, is Executive Secretary General of the European External Action Service, um, has a long and distinguished uh, career uh, to become one of France's and Europe's top diplomats, uh, starting, of course, as an ANARC, um, and, uh, but has done a number of things around the world in various positions. Uh, among them, he was Chief of Staff of the Minister of Foreign Affairs at, uh, in the Quai d'Orsay in Paris, uh, and uh, notably for us here in the U.S., he was French ambassador to the United States from 2007 to 2010. Uh, he is now uh, in a position of great responsibility to try to implement uh, something that's very exciting, which is the existence of a, a European uh, Foreign Service. And uh, we're looking forward very much to hearing him talk to us about the EU foreign policy one year after the setting up of a European diplomatic service. Okay, well, with that, let me uh, turn over the meeting to Ambassador Pierre Vimont. I think it's uh, interesting for me to come one year later, maybe to keep you um, updated about uh, what we are trying to do, uh, because it was, um, in fact, two years ago with the, the Lisbon Treaty that uh, we um, uh, decided the setting up of uh, what is a European diplomatic service, but we call it the European External Action Service, uh, if only to get everybody lost, because nobody understands really what it's, uh, what it's all about. Um, uh, about one year ago, therefore, we, uh, we implemented, we started to implement the EES. After one year, not maybe one year, but uh, several months of those infightings the uh, European Union is quite used to between member states, uh, the European Commission, and, um, and the European Parliament. And we were um, caught in the middle of this and came out with a, a roadmap that I must say, still today, many of us still don't really understand what it's all about. But with all those different hurdles, uncertainties, uh, skepticism and difficulties that we have been facing, I think one can say that the ES is there, uh, alive, kicking, and this is what I intend to prove to you as, as we move along. But of course, I don't want to speak only about the ES, even if it, I, I will spend uh, some time on it and about the tasking and what we're trying to do. I would like also maybe to update altogether um, our <coughs> knowledge about what we are with the uh, common foreign and security policy uh, for the European Union. I think um, at a time when we are facing what we all know very well, which are difficult times for the European Union, it is very important to try to understand altogether what we are facing today and what is the real, uh, the real issues that are at stake. Um, it is a, a difficult context for Europe, we all know that, not only because of the financial crisis that has uh, been hitting uh, the Eurozone rather uh, strongly in the last uh, few months and uh, last year, I would say, it's also a difficult time for Europe because as we're implementing the Lisbon Treaty, we're now all discovering that as the previous treaties, uh, it hasn't solved all the problems we're facing. The whole European integration is an ongoing process, revisited time and again, without never ending really there. Uh, the, um, the Europeans like to talk about constructive compromises or uh, constructive ambiguous uh, compromises that allow us to move ahead but still to be facing a lot of uh, work, and this is exactly where we are today. I think the second feature why we are also facing a difficult moment for Europe has to do with the, uh, glo the famous globalization, the fact that we are facing a totally new global world, and that I think this global world has been striking Europe right where uh, it hurts. 
um, whether it be the deregulation that has uh, played a major part in those recent years and that has been going adverse and contrary to what has been at the heart of the economic and social model for the European Union, which was always based on a set of regulations, um, whether it has been the new emerging powers that have come <coughs> up and that have reduced the importance of, uh, of uh, Europe, or whether it has been also the total change in what has been um, uh, the, uh, the traditional attributes of, uh, of power. And uh, you know more than anybody else about the whole story about smart or soft diplomacy and the fact that uh, this uh, new trend in our diplomatic action has been going on all this has been affecting Europe and to some extent maybe destabilizing Europe. Uh, to, uh, and we will come back into that uh, later on. But let me first talk a little bit about what is the tasking of the External Action Service before going uh, a little bit more into detail on the challenges the uh, European foreign policy is uh, facing and the assets that I think Europe still has in spite of uh, what we hear about the decline, the fact that Europe is today irrelevant. I will try at my modest uh, level to try to convince you that there is still some room for Europe and for European diplomacy. Um, the tasking for the EES, um, my intention here is uh, certainly to start a long narrative uh, of one year of uh, growing pains uh, for the implementation of the external action service. But I would rather like to underline what I think has been the formidable uh, challenge that we have been facing and the sort of innovations we have been facing that from a, a European point of view was something quite original, I must say. Uh, first innovation is that uh, the EES is neither the Commission nor the Council. It's somewhere in between, a sort of a twilight zone, grey zone, that never really existed before. And I think you have to understand that because the whole um, political confrontation of the last 60 years um, in, uh, in the European Union was always about a confrontation between the Council and the Commission. Even if it was more friendly than what has been usually said, it was still the way our minds were framed and the mindset was very important there. So to have a new administration coming in which doesn't belong either to the Council or the Commission puts everybody in a little bit of a, an uncertain position. It destabilizes the whole, the whole framework and I think we have to un understand that. Uh, the second quite innovative feature was to decide, and we have committed ourselves, to have for this service one third of the total staff coming from national diplomatic service. In other words, one third of uh, uh, diplomats from member states are supposed to come either in the headquarters in Brussels or in the delegations all around the world. And this is also something that was never tried, uh, tried before. Uh, the third innovation, I would say, even if we compare to what exists in our different uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, departments, whether it be the State Department, the Foreign Office, or the Quai is that there you have, with the uh, European External Action Service, a rather inter interesting addition of a foreign affairs ministry, a defense ministry, and a development ministry. In other words, we're pulling together, pooling together the instruments and the expertise of the commission, the economic tools that have been used for so many years in a rather interesting and, and very efficient way. But we're adding also, hence what I was mentioning previously about the one third of the diplomats coming from member states, we're adding the um, tradition of a, of a classical diplomatic service. And thirdly, we're taking on board everything that uh, all the innovation that Javier Solana <coughs> and his team have brought in the security sector, um, the military committee, the, um, the military staff, uh, the different entities that we have set up that were in charge of strategic planning or the conduct and planning of operations 
whether it be in, on the civilian side or on the military side. So one could say that this uh, service has the great advantage and the added value of having at its disposal many instruments that even national foreign services do not have. Now the whole thing, of course, is to bring them together and to make them work together, and I'll come back to that um, in, in a few seconds. Other innovation, re restricted or limited to the uh, foreign uh, affairs sector, is that we don't have any more rotating presidency. Um, it is up for the uh, president of the European Council, the high representative, the ES, and the uh, delegations around the world to represent now the European Union foreign policy. And of course, that brings about a major change in the habits of the um, of the European Union, the way we were practicing so far. It is the High Representative that shares the Foreign Affairs Council, that shares the Defense Minister's Council, and that shares the Development Minister's Council. Uh, and of course, one of the problems we're facing nowadays is that in the good tradition of our rotating presidency, the fact that you change every six months uh, used to bring uh, a dynamism every six months. You had a new active presidency that, that came in with an impressive agenda and that wanted to push things forward. Now you have a service that is there on a constant way, in a permanent way, and that has to find in itself the necessary resources to remain active, to be innovative, uh, and to come up with some interesting ideas. And it's, as you know, not always easy. Uh, lastly, uh, and I would end there, but I could add many other uh, features, but uh, another innovation, of course, is that we have now uh, a whole network of delegations around the world. In fact, uh, something like 137 delegations. And those delegations before the uh, implementation of the EES uh, were delegations from the Commission, mostly focusing on trade, on development. Most of them didn't have any political sections to do political analysis. Uh, many of them were missing some of the tradition elements of a, of a traditional diplomatic service. So now that these delegations are EU delegation and not only Commission delegation, we have to invent for them uh, a totally new way of working. We have to uh, add to what they have already political sections, and we've been going through that for the last uh, for the last uh, few uh, months. Um, and uh, we are trying to do our best to have our delegation working in cooperation with the embassies from member states and acting as a normal embassy, but this time for the European Union. Uh, this, and to add to the complexity of the whole thing, this, of course, had to be done in one blow. Um, never forget that the European Central Bank started on a progressive uh, and gradual process. We had a monetary uh, institute, first of all, and that slowly was beefed up, uh, in enhanced, and then became the European Central Bank. There, on one blue day in, in Brussels, in the month of December of uh, last year, it was suddenly decided that the ES was launched and that it should, as quickly as possible, be able to um, uh, to uh, to function on a, on a, on on a complete um, on a complete speed, and of course, this is not what could be done immediately. So, where are we uh, today? Naturally, I would say it is an ongoing process, and we will need uh, much more time to reach the final line and to be able to have a, an external action service that will work at its full efficiency, and it will take time. But let me just give you a, a few lists of what I think could be presented already as, uh, as good progress as it is going on. Um, delegations, first of all. Um, the cooperation with member states has worked remarkably well, I must say, and a little bit to the surprise of everybody. Who could have thought when we launched the EU delegations all around the world that all the 27 <coughs> member states would agree to cooperate with them and to work with them in, in, the, in, the, in the best way possible? 
In fact, that small miracle has worked uh, remarkably well. And I tend to think that it, it is not only due to the fact that uh, time was ripe, I think it's also due, let's be honest, to the fact that many mem member states are facing major financial and budgetary constraints and are looking at the EU delegations <coughs> around the world as a possible way of transferring here and there some of the work of their embassies as they move along. I've never had so many calls from many of my colleagues from different member states who have come to Brussels to ask me, when will you feel that you are reasonably efficient so that we can close some of our embassies around the world and ask for your EU delegation to take over? So we are witnessing a rather interesting process that I think will do m much more for the future of the EU uh, diplomatic network and EU foreign policy than many of the um, long discussions we can have um, here and, and there. Recruitment of uh, diplomats from member states. Um, we are already in delegations having something like 29% of diplomats from national member states working in, in, um, in delegations. There are only 13% in the headquarters in Brussels, so on average is something around 19 or 20 percent. But you see that after one year, the goal that we have uh, committed ourselves to, the 30 percent, one third of uh, national diplomats, is already progressing in, in the right way. And I find that also um, very um, uh, in interesting. Um, we have, and I think this is also something that is uh, worthwhile, we have certainly improved the crisis management process in, in Brussels. This was something that, of course, our predecessors were not doing because this was not something that was left to the Commission or the different services to the Commission. Javier Solana was trying to do that with, with, with not too many um, tools and instruments for that. He didn't have the network of the delegations that we have today. He didn't have any embassies to help him in that respect. And if you look at the way we have been able to go through um, as soon as uh, the ES was implemented with uh, the Ivory Coast crisis, Belarus, uh, Syria, Libya, you name it, we've went through all of them and through the whole Arab Spring, one can only um, recognize that slowly we have been able to implement a crisis management procedures, crisis management units that are working in the right direction. I was telling to some students a few minutes ago that we have uh, struck the imagination of everybody in Brussels because during the month of August, EES has been working. And uh, we even came out with some um, uh, sanctions against Syria. Uh, after all, it was about the uh, embargo on oil imports, which was uh, rather interesting and a rather strong statement about the need for President Assad to step aside. So um, I think that was also rather worthwhile uh, as a uh, good evidence of what we've been trying to do in the whole field of crisis management, bringing together also all the different elements of the military sector to work with us more closely. Lastly, we are fulfilling, uh, I think in a not too uh, bizarre way, the uh, previous task of the rotating presidency we are uh, in the process now of uh, um, working in a rather traditional way in, in, uh, in uh, handling the different councils uh, that we have the responsibility of. Shortcomings, there are some of course, and I will go quickly into that, but uh, if one wants to be honest, one has to admit that we still have a long way to go. I will not talk about all the details. The um, Brussels publication are talking about every day. Um, these are details and we will try to solve them as we're going on. But we're facing some major difficulties at the moment, which I think are testimony to the, uh, the extraordinary uh, adventure we're trying to build with the CES. The first one is the blending of the culture of the different institutions that we're bringing in. The fact that we're asking staff from the Commission, staff from the Council, staff from the Member States to be together and to work together. <coughs> and this has been an extraordinary experience. Of course, we're still very far away from being able 
to say that we have now a common um, <coughs> culture, a, a, a common esprit de corps, as we would say in France. Um, we're still far away from that, but we're slowly moving into that direction. Don't forget also, this is typically a Brussels um, way of doing things, we all together are still working in nine different locations. So the people from the council are still in the council building. Uh, so uh, when you talk about blending the culture, there you have a major hurdle. Uh, by the beginning of next year, we will all be together in a, one single building, and I'm sure that will help. I think the second shortcoming, and it's maybe one of the most important, is that we still need to work more on bringing to this common foreign policy for the European Union a strategic vision. Too often, at the moment, we're still working with the member states on a really patchwork uh, process uh, or patchwork approach. Think about the Arab uh, Spring, for instance. We're looking at the way we should act towards Syria the way we should act towards Yemen, the way we should act towards Libya. We haven't been able to come out with, I think, a strong political vision of what we want to do, linked to a good definition of where our interests lie and how we should work together. It has a lot to do, of course, with the fact that we may not see eye to eye all the 27 member states. But to some extent, I think it is more than that, and maybe what makes it even more complicated is that so far we were not looking as much in terms of strategic vision when we were trying to deal with foreign policy. Javier Solana came out with a very impressive uh, security strategy in 2003 and updated it later. Uh, but of course, the goals he had set up about the stability, the security, the prosperity uh, and democracy that were the goals we were pursuing was all very well. But these goals need to be implemented in a very practical and concrete way. And we're still today very far from that. And I think we still need to work more into that. Um, the last point I would say in terms of shortcoming, of course, is the relationship with the other institution, either the Commission or the Council. The fact that we have uh, taken away from these two institutions a large part of their staff uh, uh, to, let's say, one um, service and a half from the Commission, the whole DG Relex and half of the DG uh, development, um, nearly 600 staff from the Council, uh, didn't make us uh, a very friendly figure, of course, in, in, in those institutions. And to try after that to find out new ways of working together has been uh, um, a rather difficult task in the uh, nine months that we have been going through. I think things are improving, and I'm quite sure that as time goes by, we will find out how to work together. <laughs> But one should be aware of the trauma that this has created and the fact that we need more to do. So in the end, glass half, glass half empty, glass half full. Um, it's a little bit of both, of course, uh, and you will not be surprised coming from a diplomat so that I give you this kind of assessment, assessment at this stage. But I think um, one should give credit to the DES that after nearly one year, um, uh, it has moved from its launching pad and has started to do some rather interesting business, I think, but there is still much more to do. Of course, EES as such has um, is not uh, serving itself. It is working for the others and it is working for member states. It is working for the European Parliament. It is most of all, of course, working for the high representative in order to set up uh, a new common foreign and security policy. And so there, where are we at the moment and what are the challenges we're facing? I'll try to run quickly through that because you know, of course, a lot about what's going on and I have already mentioned some of the, um, of the problem. I think as I was um, hinting to that at the beginning, that the difficulty for the um, foreign policy, the European foreign policy, is that we're facing a global world that is all about 
acceleration of time, uh, a reality that is uh, more and more complex, always on the move, uh, a sense of great mobility as we are witnessing at the moment, and also, of course, a new governance of the world as we're seeing not only with the G20 meetings also, but also, for instance, the way the Security Council now is working and in a totally different way, I think, from a few years ahead. And of course, the European Union, confronted to this new uh, environment, has many handicaps. Let's face it. The whole construction um, of the European (coughs) Union is built, of course, on a delicate balance between member states and uh, the European Union institution, between the transfer of sovereignty and integration on one side and the defense and the protection of sovereignty on, on the other side. And this delicate balance, this delicate institutional construction can't not be pushed too, f- too quickly, too far. The best example, I think, and you have all witnessed that in the recent months, and you have all been wondering how can the uh, European Union not move more quickly on the whole financial aspect is this extraordinary decision taken in the months of July about increasing the uh, uh, financial stability fund, putting more resources that, there, and as it needed ratification, was still in the process of having this ratification by 17 members of the Eurozone, with Slovakia being the last one to be uh, ratifying without um, knowing yet whether they will do it or not with an incredible amount of time being spent waiting for all these ratification, where the financial markets are becoming more and more nervous and asking us to move more quickly. So this is definitely going our, against our interest, and I am quite sure that lessons will be learned from that, and that I hope we will move in the right direction with uh, provisions in the future that will allow us to move more quickly. But uh, we have to be um, aware that the whole institutional framework uh, doesn't provide us with the best way to respond to the challenges of the global world. Can I add also on a daily working process, we are witnessing the same thing. I was giving an example uh, very recently about, for instance, what we're trying to do with uh, the Arab Spring and the Arab countries. We are promising them Uh, trade concessions, one has to know that in the European world, trade concessions have to go through first a whole process inside the Commission, with today the uh, contribution of the EES, then has to go to member states to uh, adopt those proposals before even starting to negotiate with uh, the countries that will benefit in the end from these um, trade concessions. And don't forget that after that, you need also the European Parliament to give its approval. At the moment, in the European Parliament, we're not discussing about the next trade concessions from Morocco. We're discussing about the previous one that were adopted about three years ago, um, a treaty on new uh, concessions on agriculture and fisheries that hasn't been yet approved by the European Parliament for many different issues. Uh, the uh, Polisario, the uh, Western Sahara uh, issue being one of them, but not only agriculture interests are there also. So this whole combination of a very strong institutional uh, framework that is preventing us to move quickly, a daily way of doing business inside our own institution, all this um, brings us with uh, the situation where at the moment we're facing challenges that we're not being able to uh, come up to as quickly as we would like to. Um, I'm not talking even about all the usual features of what we call the um, European crisis, the problem of identity, where are our borders that we're witnessing every day when we discuss, for instance, our relationship with Ukraine. Should we consider Ukraine as having a European identity, a European perspective, 
uh, a European capacity. Uh, member states fight each other on an issue like that for the last uh, 15 months and are going on with this at the moment when, for instance, with Ukraine, we are trying to negotiate a new association agreement. Uh, I'm not talking about what should be the finality of the uh, European uh, construction, whether we should uh, promote um, the um, uh, European model outside and protect ourselves, or on the contrary, try to open more the European <coughs> Union to the outside world. These are issues that are still dragging on and that we haven't been able to agree upon. And I think this will go on for some time uh, and maybe for a very long time. The result of all this, as I was saying, is that um, we are witnessing a situation where the European Union is still um, facing the challenges of today, whether it be the Middle East peace process, uh, the uh, Arab Spring, the situation in the Balkans, uh, in the Caucasus, uh, our relation with our major strategic partners in a situation where we don't have a clear vision of what we want to do, a clear strategic vision I was talking a few minutes ago. And I think there we need to do more and we need to be much more efficient in the way we want to do it. What are our assets? And I would like to end by that. Um, the traditional assets of the European Union are well known if we want to push forward uh, a foreign policy. Um, we are a major trade partner in the world. We're a market of 500, population, 500 million population. Uh, we have a GNP uh, that is second in the world to the uh, United States. We are a major contribution contributor to international organizations. I've never seen so many international organizations coming to my office since I took up my job at the beginning of the year. Uh, we discovered that uh, Europe funds are supporting more or less all international organizations around the world. This is very impressive, up to what I discovered the other day, that we are financing a crisis room for the Arab League that has been waiting for the last two years. And I could go on and on like that. Um, I would like also to underline, because this is not always well known, that we are also a player in the security field. Um, even if we have shortcomings there, we still have managed in the last 10 years some 23-year operation in the civilian and military sector. More than 10,000 European soldiers mobilized on, on that field. Um, 5,000 policemen, we are working in, we are there in Somalia, in the Balkans, uh, and in many other places around Africa. And that is very important to be reminded. We have uh, an impressive toolbox of uh, standards, of way of acting, of mediation. Everything that has said that in the end maybe the European Union, without even knowing it, had a great influence as a sort of normative, normative um, power. Um, what has been missing, uh, and I think this is more interesting to, um, to look at, um, as I was saying, first of all, um, a political strategic vision, and I think that is very important, as I was saying, and I won't come back into that. I think we can go into more details as we move on. And maybe also a common perception of where our interests lie, um, because interests, of course, uh, are at the basis of any kind of strategy that we, uh, we can uh, we can rely on. Uh, let me give you just one example. For instance, what's happening at the moment with the Arab Spring. Uh, as I was saying previously, um, we are just looking in a sort of piecemeal process at what's going on. Um, and we haven't yet uh, really looked at the new alliances we should maybe start thinking about, whether it be with Turkey, which is playing a major role there, whether it be with some more distant countries that are starting to move into this region, whether 
be China, uh, Brazil, South Africa, or others. Uh, and we have certainly a major role to play because this is our neighborhood and uh, the European Union um, needs to be reassured about the um, stability of that region and the certainty that this region will remain stable in, in, in the months and the years ahead. So we need to figure out in a better way what we should like to do. I could say the same thing, for instance, about the Middle East peace process, which is a rather interesting example. There, Europe has poured year after year a huge amount of money. Um, we are the main a supporter of the Palestinian administration for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we are supporting the UN agency in their protection of the Palestinian refugees on a scale that not one of you could imagine. Uh, we are a payer and as the Palestinians are telling us, you are not a player. And suddenly in the middle of this, we are starting to be a player for many different reasons, because of the new position taken by the American administration, because the Arab League and others are coming to us and asking us to help them to find a way through um, at the present moment, because of the extraordinary diplomatic activity that uh, uh, Cathy Ashton has shown in the last three months, coming back and forth to the region, talking nearly every day with the different parties. Um, there we are, uh, and we don't know exactly what to do with this new role. What is the real goal we want to reach? Where do we want to go? In, uh, it's not only about saying that the two parties should go back to the negotiating table, which, which is all very well. It's also about what do we want to reach in the end. I've been quite too long and I'll stop there. but. I just wanted to end on this simple note that I think that in spite of everything that is being said about the Europe, European Union being in crisis, being in decline, becoming irrelevant, and it's true that we're going through difficult moments uh, at the time, I still think that in the field of foreign policy, there are a few things that we can observe and that are rather interesting. First of all, there is more unity than one can imagine, and we have seen that in the past. Our capacity to be on the same position with regard to what's happening in Syria or what's happening in, 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 in Libya or elsewhere. Our uh, real capacity to um, be more active in, uh, in some fields and to be more efficient than we are, were previously. And the extraordinary reserve, reservoir, of expertise and competence that we have there make me think that we should be a little bit less inward looking and a little bit more assertive in the way we want to promote our foreign policy in the months and years ahead. I've been quite too long and I apologize. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you uh, asked me long for a wonderful uh, description of what has happened in the first year of the European External Action Service. And I wonder if I could perhaps start the questions by asking you, what's your agenda as Executive Secretary General for the second year? What are the big challenges that you face? And if you were to come back and talk to us a year from now, what are the two or three things you would like to say that you had accomplished in the second year? It's a little bit unfair since you've only just gotten through no. the first year, but it does give us an idea of where you see uh, go yourself going. What I, I would like, but I don't know if it will succeed, but I would love to try is that um, I'm always struck at the moment, whether it be at the European level or at the uh, national diplomatic level, member states level, the fact that um, we are all uh, looking and seeking for new ideas in some of the um, of the um, different issues we're facing, whether it be the Balkans, now the Arab Spring, um, the relation with some of the strategic partners. Think about China. Member states are coming to us and saying and telling us what should be the two or three major priorities that will allow us to. Uh, 
to become a real strategic partner for China. Transat transatlantic relationship, I didn't want to go into that because I'm sure question will be asked, but we know very well that we have to find a, a what is it, a new narrative or something of that sort with the United States in order to work together uh, as, as we move along. Um, if the EEAS in the year ahead could be the one who comes out with uh, a few of these new ideas and is able to push initiatives there and to show that it is in innovative enough to surprise member states <laughs> and give them the impression that we can bring some added value there, I think that would be uh, very useful. So two or three policy papers that would make the difference. That would be great. <laughs> Very good. Uh, John Hogan, Kennedy School. I noticed, Mr. Ambassador, that you mentioned the military staff and the military committee with regard to the External Action Service. Does this, does this mean that the External Action Service has become the organizational expression of the common foreign and defense policy? And, uh, for example, the uh, headquarters that uh, the Weimar uh, countries want to set up would this be under the control and supervision of the External Action Service? Um, to, to your question, to your first part of your question, yes, without any doubt. Um, they are part of, um, of the External Action Service. Member states, or at least some of them, were very nervous about that and asked us to give them a special place and a special setting inside the whole organigram of the External Action Service. So this we did. At the same time, on the other side, the European, the European Parliament has requested that those military entities work very closely with the rest of the service. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there between the two, um, the two requests. But we're trying to find a way through. But they're definitely part of the service. As for the headquarters, this is another story because we're thinking and moving um, to find a way to get the right compromise between different member states. As you know, one member state is very reluctant to have any kind of headquarters. Um, we're trying to find a, a way whereby we would be more efficient in the um, uh, operational uh, planning and conduct of operations as we move along. Because at the moment, the fact that we must rely for each and every one of our operations on one different headquarter is not the most efficient way and the most cost efficient way of working and I think this can be understood by all member states so we're trying to see before the end of the year by the way if we can manage to get an agreement among all member states on that issue. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you Mr. Ambassador for this wonderful presentation. My name is Muriel Rouillet. I'm a visiting professor of um, political science and I teach a course on global Europe at the Kennedy School of government. Uh, I have a question on the Turkish question, so to speak. Um, I browsed through the list of new appointments that have been made at the EEAS recently, and many French people are there, especially uh, the head of the EU delegation in Turkey. I was wondering whether this was a kind of signal sent to Turkey. I will stop my question here because I would have an interesting case study to submit to you, but maybe I'll do this in another setting. Thank you. <laughs> The fact that you have uh, many French candidates that have been selected has nothing to do with me because I stay outside of that selection precisely for that reason. Um, these are personal choices by Cathy Ashton uh, for, for every single one of them. With regard to the, um, the new head of delegation in Turkey, uh, first of all, you must know that his predecessor was French also. He was coming from the commission, but he was from French nationality too, so there may be a tradition there. Um, I think and, and that um, it has very little to do uh, with, with, with nationality in the end. And, and I can really tell you, coming myself from a, a national diplomatic service, then once you come into the uh, external action service, it's rather easy to forget your, your, your nationality. Even if you keep links, it's normal in a normal way, links that sometimes can be helpful to get the right information that you may need. It's, uh, it's rather simple once you are working at the European level to have a totally different frame of mind. And I find that, to be honest, quite fascinating, by the way. Um, 
to be totally honest with you, when I was appointed in my new job for some time, I wondered, is this external action service really going to be relevant? Is it, uh, it, it, it can it be a success story? Um, how is it going to work for all the reasons I tried to explain? And to my surprise, as soon as I arrived in Brussels, it seemed to me very obvious that there was room for, for, for an external action service, if only because of our partners in third countries. They are the ones who are most eagerly waiting for that kind of service, so as to have one interlocutor with whom they can speak on a European interest. And one can make very easily the distinction between um, national interest and European interest, even the member states themselves. They are the ones who time and again come to us saying we would rather have it being done at the European level rather than member states on their own. So I think you can very much make the difference between the two. It may be surprising, you may wonder whether we're not becoming all of us schizophrenic, but not at all. Um, it's rather easy to make a, a difference. Let me give you one practical example. Everything that has to deal with sanctions, of course, um, that's um, uh, maybe the negative side of a diplomatic action, but this is becoming more and more a, a common feature of our uh, diplomatic action. Sanctions are much more relevant when they are taken at the European level rather at the, the member states level, and they're all asking for that, and we are now providing a process that is becoming more and more efficient up to the point where we were the first one to be able to, um, among uh, uh, different um, uh, countries, uh, to, uh, to come up with uh, strong sanctions in, in Ivory Coast to try to uh, make uh, President Gbagbo leave uh, office, and those have been rather efficient in the end. Hi, my name is Oliver Schaffer. I'm a visiting student from Germany. Um, you mentioned quite often that it's very important to have like a common vision. Um, and having that in mind, how would you describe the relationship between your institution and the, na and the national governments in Europe? Well, they are, um, with regard to a common vision, uh, they are um, working in a rather useful way. Um, once again, what has struck me in foreign policy, and we may be not even, uh, enough aware of that, is that, you know, when we launched the common foreign policy, it started in, in a very small way in the beginning of the 70s. There was a small secretariat uh, hidden in some place inside the office of the council. The four or five national diplomats who were working there were, were just trying to work and nobody would notice them. Uh, there were five people. Uh, I had a friend there. He was, uh, when I wanted to talk to him, he proposed that we meet in another place, in a mysterious place, and nobody would know. Um, that was the way we started then. And then we went on. Uh, member states discussed time and again coming back in the meetings of foreign ministers. And we have created something of a doctrine as we have been moving on that we are not maybe totally aware of. But I'm quite impressed by the fact that uh, sometimes we are more united than we think. Let me give you one or two examples. Um, uh, and I apologize for Karl Kaiser to repeat myself, but I thought that was very interesting. In the middle of August, when the American administration came to the Europeans and told them that President Obama wanted to make a very strong statement against President Assad, asking him to step aside. Um, uh, the French, the British, and the Germans said, okay, we will follow you, and we will make individual or the trilateral statement, because no way can the 27 agree on something like that. And that was the... Um, what we got from, from Berlin, London, and Paris. And we said, why? Can't we at least try to see whether the 27 cannot agree on that and cannot agree on additional sanctions? So we drafted a statement, sent it to the member states, and asked them if they could answer in the 24, next 24 hours whether they could go along with that statement, whereby we uh, requested President Assad to step aside.
27 answered in the next 24 hours, we totally agree, let's go on. Uh, and so we had a European statement uh, backing and um, adding to what uh, the American administration had said. And I thought that was quite um, interesting uh, because nobody would have thought that. Second example I would like to give to you, which I find quite interesting. Um, we, we, and it was stated and underlined that there were divisions among the Europeans on, on, on Libya and on the issue about starting a, a, a military operation. Your own country abstain in, in the Security Council. Um, and uh, we could have uh, seen that gap increasing as it went on. Some said it's going to be just like the Balkans in the 90s, where we spent uh, several years before uh, managing to look eye to eye on this. Or it could be like the Iraqi intervention in 2003, where Europeans were very much split and it took them <coughs> several years to reunite together. Here, um, after the 1973 resolution vote, uh, in less than two weeks, we managed to be back on course together. Of course, some uh, went on with the military operations, some didn't, but we worked very well together, all the 27 of us, with regard to Libya, and we worked so well that today the Libyans think that the European Union could be really the major partner in terms of assistance for the future. To some extent, we are being requested to go there in a much more deep and, and uh, serious way than the UN, for, for instance, which is quite surprising. So um, don't underestimate this capacity by working together, uh, by this dialogue that we have together, that in the end um, we manage to have a sort of common ground on which we can work in a, in a rather good way. And don't <coughs> underestimate the fact that we have the instruments and the tools that give us even more efficiency in the kind of statements that we make. The back. Um, Ambassador Bumont, thank you very much. I'm Catherine Kluver. I'm the Executive Director of the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. And so as a Europeanist and involved in the line of business that I have, um, no one could be more excited about the prospects of the European External Action Service than we are. Um, I wanted to sort of build on the question before, in fact, the two questions. Um, if you are going to create an institution which has such potential to respond innovatively to the current accelerating problems which you refer to, um, or at the business school we would say, or we think about hiring to one's weakness, i.e. looking at the current state of the institutions and the sort of the, you illustrated nicely the third, the split between the two. My question is, um, in a world where the US State Department has quickly adapted to introduce new technology into its foreign policy making, um, has ad addressed special issues within the State Department uh, with special representatives, looking at what you can request from the member states. Uh, the kind of personnel and the kind of recruitment that you can request through the member states. What do you, if we're not there now, what would you like to see to Professor Nye's question in that personnel issue over the next one or two years that you can truly respond in a quick fashion to this rapidly accelerating world with the personnel? We, um, we need plenty of personnel and of expertise because one of the problems of the External Action Service, um, I've tried to picture, uh, to paint a, a picture as rosy as possible, but uh, there are many, many um, uh, shortcomings certainly at the moment. The simple fact that um, a lot of the staff that was um, uh, transferred to us was transferred without all the, um, the necessary funds that were needed, which means that we started with, uh, with a great handicap there. Uh, the fact that um, uh, for the time being, if we need experts in many of these innovative fields you're talking about, um, cyber security, the fight against uh, terrorism, um, uh, thinking about what could be uh, an energy policy in its external dimension, etc., etc., we, we lack the expertise. Now, of course, we can go and find some inside the Commission, and this is what we're trying to do, but I'm coming back to what I was saying previously. 
the partnership with the Commission is some, somewhat uh, difficult at the moment, so it's not always that easy. So we may need to revert to uh, expertise from member states, um, with uh, experts being seconded to the uh, to um, uh, to the uh, EES. Um, even in the military field, Charles Coggan was just talking a few minutes ago. We have no experts. We have at the moment in our EU delegation no military attaché because that was not the job of the Commission delegations before. So if we want to have at least in some uh, um, in some countries uh, a military advisor or a military expert, we will have to resort to member states to help <coughs> us with that. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. So I think in all these new fields, uh, we will certainly ask for their, for their support. Now, of course, inside our staff, we have some remarkable people that are sometimes un underemployed and that we could use in a better way. And uh, we will try to make that come out in, 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 in the best way possible. Um, plenty of work to do there, no doubt. <laughs> Stanley? Uh, may I ask you a change uh, uh, geographically a little. I am struck uh, here by what I think is a growing incomprehension of the American media, at least, about what is going on in Europe. And I find it profoundly exasperating. Every other day you read about the end of the Eurozone, the end of the EU, the end of this and the end of that. Then the next day there's a three-line article saying, oh, they reached an agreement yesterday. <laughs> and then the next day it starts again. How much awareness is there in, in, uh, in your bailiwick of uh, how this sort of divorce uh, is taking place? I find it very, very dangerous and, and very mis and in fact, quite misleading. Is it simply an exercise of schadenfreude coming from the United States? Uh, is it uh, a sort of feeling well since things are not going very well here? Uh, we are not going to recognize anything that doesn't go quite so badly <laughs> elsewhere. I don't know, but I, I'm quite disturbed. Mm -hmm. And there is, for instance, of many of the many things that you have mentioned in your talk, there is absolutely no awareness here. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, being a diplomat, I won't say that I am exasperated, but no, sometimes well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, being, some advantages being, <laughs> being a great reader of the uh, American press, I, I'm quite surprised, just like you are. Um, to be totally honest, we haven't handled the uh, euro crisis in the best way possible, let's be honest, and it took us some time. But I think what quite often people don't understand is, is that this um, very peculiar process whereby uh, Europeans um, uh, go from one point to another with great difficulty, but in the end manage to make a progress out of a crisis is something that I under can quite understand that for an American mind is a bit puzzling and, 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 can, and can make your mind boggle. But I think if we manage to get out, and I think we will in the end, because what I find um, at last is a growing sense of solidarity now with regard to the Eurozone and a, a, a very strong feeling among our political leaders that they just, just can't let the euro uh, drop uh, um, and disappear. This is just not possible. This has been the main success of the whole European construction. They have to, uh, they have to keep it alive and we can do it. And in the end, it will be a major progress because we all know that when we built the monetary union, it didn't have its economic dimension, its economic component that it is now going to have at last. And I think this is very interesting. But where I am also sometimes exasperated uh, in, in the field of foreign policy is that nobody mentions in this country that we have something like 30,000 uh, European soldiers in Afghanistan at the moment. This is not as much as uh, as many as as the American soldiers, but to pretend that Europe is doing nothing in Afghanistan is 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 for those who are there 
a little bit of a mockery and, and very difficult to accept. And when you speak to um, representatives from Hungary or from other countries who have sent their soldiers there, some of them being killed from the Netherlands, from elsewhere when they were there, this is very difficult to, to accept. Where I think maybe a better awareness could, could appear is that if we were able on the both sides of the Atlantic, precisely on issues like Afghanistan or on the Euro crisis, a better exchange of views and a better exchange of where do we want to go there. Afghanistan for me is the most perfect example of, um, of a terrible mess. Um, uh, on either side uh, of the Atlantic Partnership, we don't know exactly what we want to do, uh, and everything we have tried has failed. This is typically the kind of issue that we should work together around the table to try to find a, a way through that would be suitable to all of us. And this is not the way it is working. It's either Washington coming out with a new idea and just uh, um, imposing it on the European allies, or the European allies, because of their internal domestic politics deciding to withdraw here and there because they can't wait anymore. Um, this is not a way of managing our common interests, it seems to me. Thank you very much. My name is Julita and I have a to visit visiting Spola. Um, you spoke about how difficult, more difficult it is now to work with the UN Security Council. And I'd like to refer to some of the European external action uh, which you have had, Balkan's chart, which was then handed over to the UN Atalanta. Um, in fact, for the moment, it is still operating <coughs> under UN Security Council resolutions, if you have European uh, operations, military security operations. Uh, could you give us a sense whether there are some amendments coming up on, on what basis you're going to do? Because the UN is dependent on member states also on getting uh, the resources, military, uh, etc. Is there something new coming up which you find is more difficult than before? No, it's, it's, it's maybe twofold. It's, uh, it's certainly our fault also because the, the, the setting up of uh, the ES has brought, for instance, in the DPKO uh, um, um, uh, part of the UN uh, some dismay about it, to whom should they speak now. And if you uh, call Alain Leroy, the former head of the DPKO, he will tell you that uh, he has left now, and now that he has left, he still doesn't understand exactly how we, uh, how we, uh, how we should work with uh, the uh, the ES. And to some extent, I understand him. I mean, it's it's still difficult for us to come up with uh, with uh, our new organization, and this will take maybe some time. But with regard to the operations themselves. Um, I think now we are working well together. Um, I was quite struck by the uh, the, the way uh, Secretary General Ban Ki Moon is very much looking for the uh, for the European Union to be there uh, during the whole uh, Libyan events in the last few months. Um, he had set up what we had called the Cairo Group with the Arab League, the African Union, and the European <coughs> Union, and found out uh, Ban Ki Moon found out that it was a, a very interesting setting for for trying to reach slowly and progressively a sort of common ground. This is through this that we brought the African Union more or less back to a, 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 a mainstream, even if they had still their differences uh, in public. But in private, uh, thanks to this Cairo group, it was quite interesting to see what we could do together. And I think we will see more about that. When I was talking about the Security Council, I was more th I was thinking more about recently what has happened with the attempt at the draft resolution on Syria and, and the way the four member states um, from the European Union have tried to be uh, the, on the initiative on that one. And the fact that not only have we lost Russia and China, but that was maybe not a total surprise. But the fact that we have found ourselves in difficulty with uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, I think is something we have to reflect on um, and uh, um, to, um, to look a little bit more how we can bridge, bridge the gap in, 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 in the future. 
and a lot of this will have to do with the way we act in inside the Security Council, where these countries, they are not yet permanent members, but I think at one point they will be. But anyway, their influence in the Security Council, whether they be members or not, is going to be huge and increasing, and we have to be aware of that. There is something bizarre in the fact that the um, Brazilian president, Madame Dilma Rousseff, was um, on uh, Monday, uh, last Monday in, um, of last week in Brussels, talking about strategic complicity with the European Union, and the next day um, abstaining on a resolution presented by the four member states from the European Union. There's something wrong. We have to... Uh, um, make it work in a different way. Mm. Fisher, here. Yes, uh, thank you. You're, you're the soul of patience, uh, and uh, in fact, your mode of operation. But my question is, uh, maybe, maybe covered. In, if as we look at the impending, uh, perhaps collision, perhaps not on the Palestinian issue, uh, the whole uh, reorientation to a certain amount of the Turkish issue, which was a candidate member, uh, how is your service, uh, how do you operate with this vis-a-vis -vis national positions and Brussels as a whole? Um, to come back to the question that was put to me at the beginning of this uh, uh, Q&A session, uh, Turkey for me is a typical example where we need um, new thoughts and a new way of looking at Turkey because Turkey is not only a candidate, it is also now a very active diplomatic uh, actor in, uh, in, in the region, um, not only with regard to the Arab Spring, but unfortunately also towards one of the member states, Cyprus, um, which makes, puts us in a, in, a, in, in a rather difficult position, of course, because uh, we naturally have to show our solidarity to Cyprus at the moment when Turkey is threatening the whole area about the oil drilling. So that means that what we have to find out with Turkey, uh, with whom we certainly want to um, keep on having a very close uh, relationship. Cathy Ashton sees her Turkish counterpart uh, more than every month, uh, I would say every two or three weeks. They have very close relationship and we intended to have it that way because we're facing once again a very active diplomacy at the moment and we'd rather be close to them to see how things evolve. It is more complicated than what one could say. It's not because the Turks are active, because Prime Minister Erdogan goes to Egypt and Tunisia that suddenly, just like a miracle, uh, the relationship is going to improve with uh, Egypt and Tunisia and become a very strong alliance. If you talk to our Egyptians colleague, they're more than cautious uh, with regard to that. And so it's really about um, taking what is useful from this um, uh, Turkish new diplomacy and what is maybe less and, and trying to use it in a better way to set up a partnership with um, um, with um, with Turkey um, without prejudice to what will be in the end the result of the accession negotiation. This is for another day and we will see how it will evolve. Whether Turkey becomes a member or doesn't become a member, we will still need to have a very close relationship and partnership with Turkey and we have to work on that one. And we have plenty of things to do together. How to use the, f the, the sheer energy of Turkey at the moment in the region, for instance, um, on oil drilling in order to have it in a, in a friendly and cooperative way uh, with Cyprus, with Israel, with Lebanon, because many countries of the neighborhood are at the moment looking at the um, gas resources in that part of the Mediterranean. Why not try to have a, a good cooperation altogether? Let's try to build something of that sort that would alleviate some of the um, some of the pressure that exists there. How to work maybe with Turkey and how could they help us in our relationship with Iran? 
they have tried their own <coughs> initiative with the help of with the assistance of Brazil. It hasn't worked. Turkey has become more cautious with Iran, but they still have this uh, direct channel how to use it, maybe in the best way possible, to try to avoid the um, train wreck we're seeing in the, in the whole issue of the nuclear program. Mm. Um, these are the kind of uh, things I think we could we could um, we could build on. With regard to the Middle East peace process, it's much more complicated, of course. Um, we've all been through that for many, many, many years. I think the Europeans maybe can bring um, something in, into that issue, if only because um, what I was saying previously, that the fact that we have this very special relationship with the Palestinian Authority in terms of uh, assistance and support we have been giving to them for many years. That gives us maybe some leverage there. But one of the main problems, in my opinion, of uh, the European foreign policy is that we have, in fact, an extraordinary uh, resource in terms of leverage, and we have never used it, uh, really, um, as if we were a bit frightened by becoming a real a global actor in the uh, in the um, in uh, in a strategic actor in the global world. Um, we're a bit frightened by that responsibility to some extent, it seems to me. Mm. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bernard Metz. I'm a student, a European student at the Kennedy School and also the head of the European Club at the Kennedy School. And um, my question builds a little bit up on Professor Hoffman's question. Um, you mentioned this increasing unity within the European Union concerning its um, common foreign policy. But uh, being an effective and uh, powerful player in the global scale does on, not only depend on the internal unity, but also the external acceptance and perception of the foreign policy. So um, there is a famous person from the Harvard com community who once made fun about the European Union or the European communities at that time for not having a, a common um, phone number. Um, last year, Catherine Ashton was here and actually also made a joke about this, said now Europe has a common phone number, but when you dial it, then it will tell you, for the German position, please dial one, and so on. Um, my question now is, how is your experience um, with the United States now dialing phone numbers? Would they dial your fun phone number, or Catherine Ashton's phone number, <coughs> or a Berlin phone number, or a Paris phone number, and so on, in terms of um, foreign policy decisions? Oh, I could give you an anecdote, but um, um, I have to go further than that. But at uh, one of those uh, think tank sessions I, I was uh, facing um, in, uh, in Brussels a few months ago, where everybody was um, um, criticizing the ES and um, um, blowing, sending me blows all over. Um, uh, at one point, the American ambassador came in, he was there also, party to that session, and said, listen, I'm the only one who is going to support the ES, but let me tell you that uh, when we have a EU-US um, summit, um, it's um, uh, m much easier for President Obama and his predecessors and certainly his successors uh, to know the faces they are uh, facing, um, to know the people that are there and that do not change uh, at every summit when, when we meet. So therefore this sense of stability is something I find uh, uh, quite interesting, he said. Um, and going a little bit further than that, I think that may explain to some extent, I was wondering the other day why suddenly um, we are uh, talking more about the quartet than we used to talk uh, a few months ago. Uh, and Cathy Ashton, of course, being very active there, is that you must not forget that before the Lisbon Treaty, when we had a meeting of the quartet, we had Javier Solana, Mrs. Ferrero Vanner, and the rotating presidency, the three of them uh, coming there. Um, the fact that now we have only one person for the uh, European Union is, I think, um, uh, um, making a, a slight difference, at least for the time being. Now, having said that, and this is what I wanted to say, we still have to do our homework inside the European Union, of course. And the fact that we still have today, when you have the G20 meeting, 
um, the two presidents of the European Council and the European Commission representing the European Union as such is, I think, something that more and more people find difficult to, to accept. So we will need to do some progress there, undoubtedly. Yeah. But this is the whole issue about how can we simplify our institutional framework um, and that will take uh, and it will take some time. And by the way, I think that for the time being, it can even become more complicated, as we all feel the need for more flexibility inside the whole system. And so you could face the prospect of small groups of member states working together with uh, what we call enhanced cooperation on one field and a group working on on another one. I think you will may see more of that as as we move along. That's the way we have been working, and one has to get used to that. But definitely with regard to foreign policy, if you need to call Brussels, the EES and the high representative are there, 24 hours. <laughs> oh, yes, thank, you. thank you, Ambassador. My name is Keisha O'Neill. I was an intern in the U.S. Embassy in Slovakia for a while, and um, it seems that there is a lot of hesitance based on a lot of misinformation and lack of information about what the European is and what they're doing. Um, the main drive to educate the public about what is the European Union ended after the, they acceded um, to the EU. So my question is, do you see in the future with more resources, um, the service taking a role as the United States State Department has done in educating people about what they're trying to do within the country? Yes, I, I, I mean, we have um, a whole objective of, of, of communicating better and explaining better. Um, but at the moment, we have, first of all, very few resources, a few success stories, but more to come, I hope. So we're only at the beginning of it all. But certainly, as, as we move along, we will have to explain that more and more. We're doing it as much as we can with national parliaments from member states, you know, because they're coming to see us and, and asking, uh, what are you doing? Um, and they feel very much relieved when we're telling them that we're, it's not new money coming into the ES, but uh, money that has been transferred from um, one, <coughs> one institution to another. Um, but we're going to be uh, we're going to be monitored very closely by all those. So um, um, uh, all this is of course very important in terms of informing member states about what we're doing. Coming back to what I was saying previously at the beginning of my intervention, it is also a lot to do with the fact that in many member states, um, foreign offices. Are becoming uh, are coming under strong pressure to close more and more of their diplomatic networks, um, and if, if we could find the right complementarity there, I think that will be useful for for everybody. But of course, then the ball is in our camp. Um, in other words, the ES will be able to provide member states with a um, uh, substitution, with uh, uh, an option when they have to close their embassy, if we are able to deliver uh, the kind of services they're asking for. If we're not able to do that in terms of political analysis, political reports, um, uh, efficient démarche, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then member states will have no no appetite in in, in giving us this um, uh, this um, this responsibility, but don't underestimate what is happening at the moment in member states because I'm I was quite struck uh, as soon as I arrived. It's not only about the country where you worked. It's it's all about Netherlands. It's about Sweden. It's about Denmark, Austria, Hungary. And in, uh, in a few years' time, it will be about Britain, France, and Germany also, because everybody is under great pressure. And to have uh, those different diplomatic networks being unable to try to use the resources of the other and, and to try to, um, to share their resources is something that will not be able to go on for long. We have been already working with, with very practical but useful examples. For instance, our, 
our head of the our, our EU delegation in Japan has proposed to be the only one who does the daily press review and to send it to all the other um, um, uh, embassies of member states um, and allow them to cut into their press office. Very simple things like that. If we go on doing that, that will give a good <coughs> image of the uh, EES, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, uh, I'm Alexander Epe, a student uh, from the Kennedy School and also the Business School at Stanford. Uh, so my question is regarding to the transatlantic, transatlantic relations. And uh, we have heard really frequently in the last years that uh, the U.S. is facing a shift of focus from the transatlantic relations to the U.S.-China relations facing the Pacific. Uh, however, when we look at the hard data, it's interesting to see that last year, the U.S. invested in the European Union 14 times more than Russia, Brazil, China, and India all together. So with this in mind, wouldn't be in our best interest, and uh, now speaking as a European, to reinstate or refocus our diplomatic efforts in the relationship with the U.S. to try to have like, a common diplomatic vision uh, and a common position in the world uh, affairs? Yes, you're you're totally right. I'm I'm always surprised when I hear when I read about this. Uh, you know, G two, uh, the United States is not interested anymore in Europe, but much more interested in China. Um, we, the European Union, are, are just as interested in China as the United States. Also, we're all interested in China, just like we're interested in India and Brazil and others, and therefore we're all making this kind of shift. Um, um, and this is why, time and again, you hear observers talking about the need to reassess the transatlantic partnership, uh, to update it, and, and I think it's quite right. It's still very much at the core of our diplomatic action. We still share, I think, the same values and the same convictions, and what we need is precisely to sit around the table and to discuss a little bit more about what the core of our partnership is about, what are our core interests and how we should work together. Now, this is where maybe something is lacking, is that we all know that it is not in those very formal meetings, summits or whatever they are, um, that have been prepared by uh, officials so as that nobody really has interesting discussion. Um, this is not in these summits that we are able to have an off-the-cuff discussion about all this. And... Um, we haven't been able to find the right setting for that, but at one point I think that with regard to the transatlantic relationship, just like in his time Giscard d'Estaing invented the G4 where they met in, in a rather relaxed atmosphere in Martinique or somewhere, um, I think at one point it would be very interesting for the Europeans to meet with the Americans and try to think a little bit uh, where this partnership is going and how we need to um, to um, bring a new vigor into it and, and a new sense of common purpose which seems to be missing a little bit. And we all know that with regard to NATO, the way NATO is evolving, we will need altogether to think much more about where we're going in our strategic partnership than what we have been doing so far. We know very well that with some of the emerging partners, we have a common interest in trying to find the proper way to work with these new partners. Um, all this is never really talked about, um, and this is um, this is sad. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the Peters um, Associate of Russian Research Center, have a question on the representation. I would assume that the smaller uh, members are more likely to prefer to uh, close their embassies. And in time, I could envision a kind of a two tier um, representation of the larger states having their own, but the smaller uh, ceding <coughs> to the EU. Is, do you see that sort of pattern? It, it could be, uh, to, to be honest, in the more general terms, uh, not only representation, but the general trend of where the our institutions are, are going. I think this division is becoming a major source of concern. Uh, 
um, when you go to those small and medium um, uh, size countries, and I did that during the summer where I attended a few of their ambassadors' conference, there is one way of having a great success is to shout at the big three. Um, they are becoming less and less popular, to put it in the, in the, the fact, and the sheer fact, and we all know that this is necessary, but the way this is being done, for instance, in the whole euro crisis, the fact that Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel meet regularly. I don't know if you have uh, read the reaction from Franco Frattini uh, yesterday, which was really uh, very unfriendly and very uh, irritated. And I can tell you that irritation among member states, small and the, the non-three, big three, is growing. European councils are, contrary to what uh, everybody is saying, European councils are becoming fraught with that kind of, uh, of um, uneasiness and, uh, and uh, irritation from all the other member states that are not the big three because they have the feeling that all this has been uh, decided previously and that they have no say anymore. And this kind of distinction, this kind of division is, is not good. Um, it has always, uh, it has existed, we all know that. But maybe um, leaders in the past had another way of doing it, so it didn't, didn't show too much or whatever it is. Uh, but I detect that there is a great concern, maybe also because um, it was e more easily accepted when we were 12 or 15, now that we're 27. It's, uh, it is, um, you know, the, uh, the new member states um, didn't have this tradition and didn't know, the, they haven't gone through that experience like the, uh, the former members have been going through year after year. I don't know. Anyway, I can I, I detect a very strong irritation there. So from there on, going back to the, your question, yes, there is a, a reality there that exists already, of course, because um, I remember the other day it was a very nice observation made by one of the um, uh, Baltic uh, um, uh, Baltic states, I wouldn't say which one, um, we were discussing about Arab Spring and he said, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much interested in listening to all of you who have so much expertise and experience in that, that part of the world where I have no ambassador, no embassy, nothing, so uh, I am very much interested to listen from you, and if I can help in any way, let me know. I'm quite ready to help. Uh, so you have those differences that are appearing more and more, and of course member states who have a rather small network, uh, diplomatic network, and those who have a full-fledged uh, diplomatic network in nearly uh, every, every country around the world. So all this makes it more important for the ES to be here as um, uh, uh, an administration that can assist, that can help if, uh, if necessary. Mm. Yes. My name is Marina Scarmera. I'm a PhD student uh, visiting scholar from Italy. Uh, my question regards uh, the common European energy policy that you mentioned before. Uh, what would be, in your opinion, its future? And what would be the European um, position vis a vis Russia, the interdependence with this supplier? Um. <coughs> A common energy policy um, is certainly one of the priorities we should be working on uh, at, the, at the level of the European Union. Everybody is is um, is quite aware of, of, of that, but the problem is that so far we haven't been able to do that. And most of the member states, those who have uh, important stakes in, in into that energy policy, want to retain their 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 national power, their national sovereignty in that field. With regard to Russia, that's obvious. Um, if we, uh, we, it's just as simple as that. If we were all united in our negotiation with on gas with Russia, 
we would have a much stronger leverage. And, and Russia is playing, is having a field day playing one against the other at the moment. It's so obvious that we should have done that for a long time now. But we have great difficulty in doing that because member states still think that uh, they will get a better deal if they just work on their own. Uh, but this is true about Russia, but it will be true as we move al along with uh, the Gulf countries. It will be true wherever we find out new sources of uh, resources of energy. And uh, talking about this, you know, uh, and, and you make the link with what we were talking previously about China, the fact that China is running all over the world to find um, resources in energy and and, and, and other um, and other raw material um, and raw resources. Um, for us, uh, if we want to have a strong foreign policy, this should be a major element of um, of the kind of strategy we want to build on. And we're very very far away from having anything that looks like a strategy in that field. Uh, I guess we have one more question, Pietro. But, uh, um, good evening. I'm Pietro Rabassi, another European student at the Kennedy School. Um, I wanted to ask you, as perhaps the final question to wrap up, um, which areas of cooperation among the member states uh, would you envisage or you wish to have in the next uh, years and um, decades? Um, in third, in third um, countries outside of the EU, um, as areas of cooperation where the EU member states will not count anymore, and instead the EU will play the role representing the whole, the old members, old member states. We've spoken about energy. What other areas could you envisage? Thank you. Even the limit of the treaty, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I. I think I don't mean by that, and certainly not as we are fighting um, among each other uh, about the whole issue of external representation and whether when EU represent member states, should member states still retain uh, some competence and some possibility of speaking by themselves and uh, having their own action. I would cert certainly not think um, in answering your question about uh, the... Um, the prospect of uh, Europe doing everything and member states just leaving and, and not uh, not working in, 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 in such or such field. It's more, as always, about being complementary and sometimes the European Union's taking the lead and the other ones uh, staying behind. But it seems to me as, um, as we're moving on and uh, facing financial constraints more and more, the whole field of uh, development assistance um, is something where uh, we need to uh, be more efficient altogether and to be much more complementary that we are uh, having strong cooperation. And another field I think that is related to that one where we could work much better together is the whole fight against the, the, the whole counter-terrorism policy. Because on that one, as on many others, it is a combination of different elements. In other words, we can play very well together with member states where they can bring, for instance, their huge and very strong military assistance, for instance, whereas the European Union can bring its civilian tools, its development tools. Um, in a whole region like the Sahel, which is being at the moment totally destabilized by what's happening in Libya or elsewhere, uh, and you can detect that up to North Nigeria, um, I think the combination of um, strong uh, member states' action and the European Union action is really the recipe for possible success, and we have to uh, be much forthcoming in, in that field that we have been in the past if we admit that terrorism is one of the major threats we're, we're facing. It certainly is. Well, please join me in thanking Ambassador Mimar for a very rich conversation. <laughs> very good. Thank you.